Let's pray together, shall we? What an image, Father, that we were just given of the angels in heaven crying, Holy, 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 over and over and over again, because that's what you are. Forever and ever, you will be proclaimed to be holy. And Lord, it's our earnest desire to be your holy people. We want our actions to match with our profession. We want to be a people of God. And Father, I pray that as we have had the opportunity to sing these songs and as we've had the opportunity to be ushered into the throne room of your grace through the songs that we sung, I pray now as we open your word that our hearts and minds would be in tune with what it is you have to say to us. Father, we are an easily distracted people. Our phones, our tablets, our televisions, the media, the social media, we are constantly bombarded with information, most of it useless. And I pray now, Father, that we would pay close attention to very useful information information that comes from God Himself. And Lord, we thank You that You have revealed Yourself in Your Word, that You've given us a text of Scripture that we can read and understand and learn more about You. We're humbled, Father, that You love us with an everlasting love. And Lord, each one of us has our own, our own faith story, our own journey here this morning. And so I pray for those of us that name the name of Christ, that today would be a day where we would grow closer into the image of Jesus. But Lord, I pray also for those that are here this morning that do not know you, that perhaps have gone to church their entire lives, but have never committed their life to you, that they don't know you personally and in a relational way. I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. And Lord, I pray for those that are new to this whole church thing, this whole Christianity thing. I pray that your spirit would be working in them as well. We're so grateful that they're here. And so Lord, this is a divine appointment. We recognize that we're all here for a very specific purpose that you have foreordained before the beginning of time. You want us each to learn something, each to grow, each to become more like your son. So, Father, I pray that you would use my feeble attempt at communicating your truth, that you would multiply my efforts, that you would protect me from saying things that would be incorrect, but, God, that everything that is spoken would bring bring honor and glory and praise to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have a serious and a sobering question for you this morning. It is a serious and sobering question. I know sometimes sometimes I catch you off guard and I try to be funny. This is not one of those times. First of all, I'm not very funny. But secondly, this is a very serious question. Do you pray? Do you pray? Now, I'm not talking about the kind of praying that you might pray just before you hit a tree, or, or, or maybe a student might pray, and Lord, help me pass this exam even though I haven't studied a bit. Not that kind of prayer. I'm not asking, do you pray in that kind of way. I'm asking, I'm talking about a regular, consistent, committed time of personal worship before the, before the God who gave you life. Do you, in that sense, do you pray? Prayer is not easy. It's not fun. Most of the time, prayer is hard work. Quite frankly, every time we go to God in prayer, we are going to war with the devil simultaneously. Prayer is hard work. 
Oswald Chambers said this. He said, prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. And to be perfectly honest, we cannot do this Christian life without the lifeline of prayer. Martin Luther said, to be Christian, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. And yet, as a Christian, I have let significant time pass without bending the knee to whom deserves all the glory and honor and praise. Maybe we don't like to pray because we have the wrong idea of what prayer should be. I don't know, but I do know that There have been chunks, large chunks in my life where I've forsaken the opportunity to pray. Billy Graham said this, the Christian life is not a a constant high. I think, before I continue to read this, I think that's a very wise and good word, especially with new Christians, or especially those of you that are exploring Christianity. The Christian life is not a constant high at all. He goes on to say, I have my moments of deep discouragement. I have to go to God in prayer with tears in my eyes and say, Oh God, forgive me or help me. And really this gets to the heart of the matter, doesn't it? Oh God, forgive me. Oh God, help me. These are powerful prayers that the believer needs to pray. Graham understood all too well the challenges of, that Christians face day in and day out and how much we need God's power to make it through yet one more day, yet one more hour, yet one more minute. Max Licato said it so well. Our prayers may be awkward. Our attempts may be feeble. But since the power of prayer is in the one who hears and not in the one who says it, our prayers do make a difference. So you may feel inept at prayer. You may feel like you have no idea how to pray well. And you've been at it for many, many years. Take heart. The power is not in your prayer. The power is in the God that you are praying to. And so, my dear friends, we need to hear a word from God on this subject. We need to understand very clearly uh, that while we may not fully understand the intricacies of prayer, how prayer works, uh, why does does a sovereign, omnipotent God need to hear from us? Why does He even want to hear from us? We may not understand the intricacies of prayer, but we are commanded to pray nonetheless. And we need to remember that we are a people who pray. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ here, you are a person who is to pray. That's the bottom line. There are many reasons why we are to pray. We, we praise Him. We, are, we, we praise God. Uh, we, when we pray, we confess our sins against Him. We pray to thank Him. There are many, many reasons that we are to pray. But this morning, I'd like to share with you the reasons laid out in Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. And I think you'll find that Paul's reasons not only are compelling, but challenging and convicting. Uh, Again, as we've worked through this book, and if this is your first time here today, I welcome you to Allendale Baptist Church. Uh, What we do here at our church is we, we walk through books of the Bible. Okay, we preach through books of the Bible, and we try to try to gain as clear an understanding of a particular book of the Bible as we can. So, we're, if you're a first-time visitor here today, you're on the tail end of the book of Colossians, and so the first half of the book of Colossians is really about theology, deep and 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 helpful theology, and then the last half is all about. How does the theology work out in life? It's the practical end. So today is very, going to be very practical in the arena of prayer. I think you'll find that Paul's reasons are very compelling. But, but, but if, you take, if you take his words, or, or God's word for that matter, to heart, if you take God's word to heart, you, and I, I, emph- I, I, I cannot emphasize this enough, 
If you take God's word to heart in this area, you will see God move in our midst in ways you never dreamed possible. I believe that. And one way specifically, the gospel. Yes, that's right, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You will see God move in our midst in ways you never dreamed possible with the gospel. This is what Paul is trying to help us with, the good news of Jesus Christ, that he, the sinless God-man, came to this earth to seek and to save that which was lost. Do you know what or whom was lost? People, you and me. Perhaps even this morning you are lost, and God the Father sent God the Son to save you from an eternal punishment called hell. Jesus did this by offering his life on a Roman cross as a payment for your life so you would not need to endure hell for all of eternity. This was the deal that was made. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection would pay for your sin debt and allow you to go free and enjoy the promise of eternal life, the eternal resurrection. What's your part of the bargain? Faith. You must believe in Christ and what he did for you. You must accept this wonderful free gift and become a follower of Christ. And I beg you today, if you are not a believer, let's make today the day that you come to faith in Jesus Christ. Believe what he has to say. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says so clearly, For by grace that you have been saved through faith, and it is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to enjoy the promise of heaven, you must accept the gift of God. You must accept salvation by faith. If you do, you will become a new person in Christ, and you will have the promise of eternal life. Listen to what 1 John says in chapter 2. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide or live or dwell in you. If what you have heard from the beginning abides or dwells or lives in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has made to us, eternal life. You know, there's people in your lives that have made promises to you that they have fallen through. In fact, I've probably made a promise to you where I didn't follow up the way I should have. And maybe you've made promises to people that you've fallen back on. But we serve a God who gives promises that he never falls back on. He always keeps. And if he says that he'll give you eternal life, he promises that you will get it. It's a gift, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy that he saves us. This passage that Paul shares is, 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 more, is more than for you just as an individual. We have a massive, a massive job to accomplish. It's a huge job to accomplish. It's, it's more than just your individual salvation. Ladies and gentlemen, do you realize, Tim's been doing some research for us, you, there's, there's over 26,000 people living in Allendale, Michigan. And there are 13 evangelical churches that I pray for regularly, and I hope you do as well. Now, I'm, I'm no math whiz, believe me. And so, Greg, if I'm wrong, you set me straight here. Uh, I'm no math whiz, but, but I'm pretty sure that each one of the 13 churches do not have 2,000 people attending every Sunday. And by the way, this does not include the 25 to 30,000 students at Grand Valley State University. So we have a great task ahead of us. Nothing like job security. Sometimes you might ask the question, why does God keep me around here? My mom, at the end of her life, she kept saying, why, why does the Lord keep me here? Why does the Lord keep me here? Because he still has something for you to do, Mom. Why is the Lord keeping you here? 
because the Lord has something for you to do. The Lord has something for us to do as a church. We have a lot of work to do, folks. And it's more than just coming to church on Sunday and singing wonderful songs and praising Jesus corporately. We have to go out to all the nations, and we need to start right here in Allendale. And I'm sure the Colossians were feeling the same way that you may be feeling right now. After all, they had a similar population, actually, as we do. And they might have been saying things like, that's impossible. We cannot reach all these people for Jesus. There's no way. And maybe you're thinking that right now. That this is impossible. 26,000 people. Of course, some of those people are Christian. And the 30,000 students, of course, some of those are, are Christian. But the vast majority of the population in Allendale and at Grand Valley State University are not believers in Jesus Christ. And, and Green, you're off your rocker if you think that we, this little church, can do something about that. You may be thinking those things. Well, I want to tell you something to encourage you. Jesus had only 12 working for him, and I'd say he did a pretty good job 2,000 years later. It's not about numbers, folks, because nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. Nothing is impossible. And so, where do we start? Where do we start? How do we accomplish such a monumental task of reaching this huge, seemingly insurmountable, impossible number of people? Where do we start? On our knees. That's where we start. We start on our knees, of course. <laughs> you might think, wait a minute, wait a minute. We, we should get an org chart. We should get a strategic plan going. And, we, man, we, and, and boy, that stuff, I, that, I love that stuff. But that's not where we start. We start on our knees. And how about we try it God's way and we see what happens. And I'm trusting as you walk through this passage of Scripture with me today, you will leave changed. That's my prayer. God has, God has busted my chops with these few verses, and I'm praying he does the same thing for you this morning. Let's do it his way and see what happens. We must be a people who know how to pray. And if you, if you want to see God move in our community and save people, we have to start with prayer. And really, that's the main idea of the sermon for you this morning. Uh, the proper prayer propels the gospel forward. Proper prayer propels the gospel forward. So we're going to talk about Paul's idea of proper prayer. Paul, Paul, Paul's commands give us great hope to be fierce prayer warriors. And the first thing we must do, according to Paul, is the first idea for this morning, and that's this. Proper prayer demands constant prayer for yourself. That seems counterintuitive, but let's see what he has to say. Proper prayer demands constant prayer for yourself. You've heard me correctly. Let's look at the text. It says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. So, if you look closely into this text, we see three ways in which the Apostle Paul tells us how to pray. And as we look at these three ways, I want you to compare this list that I'm going to give you out of this text with your own prayer life and see how well you're doing in the prayer department. This isn't meant as a guilt trip. It's meant as a spiritual kick in the pants. To say, how am I doing in the area of prayer? And by the way, the Lord kicked me in the pants this week with this text. So, the first thing we see is pray steadfastly. Pray steadfastly. That's the first part of the verse. It means to persevere devotedly. God understands how much you need Him. In fact, I would submit to you, He knows way better than you do. He, he understands way more clearly than you understand of how much you need Him. We think we can make it through this life in our own strength. We'll figure it out somehow as we go along. What we need to figure out is that we can no longer go along without Him. And so Paul lays out the command to devote yourselves to prayer. 
That's what the New American Standard says. So the question that I have for you is, would you say that you are devoted to prayer? Is this something that is a regular part of your life? Number two, pray watchfully. Not only are we to pray steadfastly, but we are to pray watchfully. Well, watchfully, what does that mean? It means to be on the alert. In other words, it means that we're to wake up And have our minds engaged in the conversation that we're having with the almighty God of the universe. Do you remember when Jesus was about to go to the cross and he he brought some of his disciples with him and he was praying with them? And, and, what, and, 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 And he went off to pray by himself and he came back and what did he find his disciples up to? They were snoozing, man. They were, they fell asleep. And what was, what was Jesus, what was Jesus' question to them? Could you not pray with me for one hour? That's the idea. Wake up. Wake up in our prayer time. Now, I don't know about you, but there are times when I am praying that I can get a little bit sleepy, and maybe you have that same problem. In fact, it's kind of fun sometimes when I'm preaching, and, and I can tell when you're starting to lose it, your eyes are fighting to stay open, and, and, and your head begins to bob, and, and then your wife elbows you into the side, and then you say something to the effect of, I was just concentrating on what the pastor was talking about. I just, if I have my eyes closed, I can concentrate a little better. I get it. I, I understand. If I had to listen to me, I'd put myself to sleep too. I get it. But imagine. But imagine falling asleep while you're talking to the one who is your king, who is your Lord, who is your Savior. This is what Paul is driving at. When it comes to your time with the Lord, wake up. Engage your mind. Talk out loud if you need to. Do whatever it takes to keep alert because I will tell you that this is very important because there is one who is out there who is seeking to destroy you and your only defense is the one you are praying to. In Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32 Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. Now, I don't know, I don't know exactly what that is, but Satan was demanding to have Peter so that he could sift him like wheat. That does not sound pleasant, right? But what did, you, what did Jesus say? I love this. But I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. I have prayed for you. Wake up! William Cowper said this, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon their knees. He trembles. Paul is admonishing the Colossians to stop being pansies in prayer. You are in a battle, and the battle is won or lost on your knees. And if you think otherwise, you need to reevaluate how it is we live this Christian life. So how about you? Are you constantly being alert in your prayer? Uh, be, Be a prayer warrior, not a prayer wimp. And this is how we are to pray. We're to pray, according to the Apostle Paul here, we're to pray steadfastly and we're to be alert about it. And if you're not, if your prayer habit has turned into somewhat of a meh obligation, you're kind of tired, then shake it off and get at it. Wake up and and pursue prayer in the way that you should. And I would would say pray to God and ask for that strength to reinvigorate yourself so that you might have that kind of steadfast and alert communication. Today is a great day to make that kind of a commitment. But then he adds one more thing, that I, uh, one more characteristic on how believers are to pray. Right? We're, we're to pray steadfastly, we're to pray alert, and then we're to pray thankfully. You see that? Why would Paul throw this word in? That we're to, we're pr- to pray thankfully. 
So far, this, this sentence that he's written has felt aggressive and, and warlike. But now, he says that while you're continuing in prayer and you're being watchful, I want you also to be thankful. Well, what might we be thankful for, especially in the light of the context of this passage? Well, one thing is you might be thankful that you can pray. Are you thankful that you can actually talk to the God of the universe? That when Jesus Christ died on the cross and the veil was torn in two from top to bottom, that it opened up the throne room of grace, and that you don't have to have a priest now to go to, go to God. You can go to God at any point in time, whenever you want, however you want. It doesn't matter. He wants to hear from you. Are you thankful that you can pray? You can be thankful that you can pray. You can be thankful that God wants to hear from you often and regularly. That is amazing That to me. I, I mean, can you imagine, you know, me constantly knocking on your door? Hey, hey, how's it going? Hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? I'd probably drive you nuts. But God wants to hear from us over and over and over. He's not irritated about it. He loves to hear from his children. We've had little Elliot living with us, and uh, he, uh, I'll be working in my office, <clears throat> and I'll hear him get up. He runs up the stairs, and he runs over, and he opens up the door. Papa! Now, I'm working on stuff. Very important. I mean, I'm a high-powered senior pastor, for, after all. <laughs> I mean, come on. I'm working on very important things. And he says, Papa, I turn my chair, and he has all of my attention. I could care less about what I'm working on. Now I'm focused on what he wants. That's your God. God wants to hear from you. He wants to hear from you often. You can be thankful that he wants you to be alert and to have a conversation with him. You know, God's not interested in vain babbling and mindless repetition. He wants your brain to be engaged, and you can be thankful that you have a brain that can be engaged in this conversation with God. You can be thankful that he is your only hope against spiritual warfare. And if we take into consideration the whole context of this particular letter, you can be thankful that Jesus Christ is the supreme ruler of the universe who holds all things together. So this list... Just this list that I've given you from from verse 2, there's a whole lot more that we could be thankful for. These are just a few things. So how much time do you spend thanking God, thanking Him for who He is, thanking Him for what He has done and what He will do, thanking Him for the good, the bad, and the ugly, and especially thanking Him for the glorious, amazing, mind-blowing gift of salvation that you did nothing to earn and you do nothing to keep. We can thank Him for those things. These ten words are not all that God has to say about prayer in the Scriptures, but they do pack a punch if you slow down and try to understand what he's saying. And the point is this. Paul wants this for you. Paul wants this for you. He wants you, every one of you in this room, he wants you to continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful with thanksgiving. That's what he wants. Why? Because it is only through the power of prayer that we are able to accomplish anything of lasting spiritual eternal significance. And if you fail to pray for yourself first, you, hear me, if you fail to pray for yourself first, you are setting yourself up for satanic attacks that you simply will not be able to withstand. Pray for yourself. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8-10. through 10 say these very important words. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Be sober-minded, folks. Be watchful. Don't be foolish. 
Pray for yourself first. Pray for yourself often. Satan wants to sift you like wheat. Commune with God. It's your only hope. I remember the remember the movie uh, um, Rocky, and then I don't know. Was it was it been like sixteen Rocky movies? I don't know. The, you know, right? And I mean the fir- the first Rocky movie. You know, he's he's uh, he's out. Hey, Mick, how you doing? How you doing? You know, I mean, that was he didn't have a lot of lines to learn. I mean, I think that was about it. Hey, Mick, how you doing? Hey, yeah. And you know, and you'd see him, and he's in the meat locker, and he's he's punching the meat. You know, doo, 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 and he's doing this, and he wasn't a great boxer, really, right? I mean, uh, you know, he trained. I mean, he was he you know skipping rope and he's lifting weights and he's he's boxing in the ring and he's you know do, uh, mook, uh, mook, you know and then he gets in the ring and he starts fighting and if if you've ever watched a rocky movie this is how rocky fights <laughs> he doesn't put his hands up he just gets the tar beat out of him for the first half an hour and then all of a sudden something happens and then he just starts wailing on this person right he's He's just boom, 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 and he ends up winning. You know, dun, 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 right? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, this is, he's so, he's so determined and he's so purposed in getting ready for the fight, he's doing just about everything imaginable, including punching sides of beef to get himself ready to take those punches and to win the fight. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to be steadfast in prayer. You have to be steadfast in prayer. You have to work at it. You have to see how important it is. And you're going to take some punches, folks, but you've got to work at it. Prayer is hard work because prayer is a spiritual battle. It just is. It's a spiritual battle. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12 Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We're in a spiritual battle, folks. But remember this. Remember 1 John 4, 4. Little children... You are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Friends, if we want to see real change, if we want to see the most important thing happen in our town, that that people see and hear and understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, it has to start with you getting serious about prayer. And you need to make a promise right now that you will continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. You need, to, you need to make that promise to God that this is the kind of prayer person you're going to be. Will it be easy? No. Will you fail? Yes. But will you get back up and get at it? I hope so. The gospel depends on it. And you have to start with yourself first. Let me give you just a very simple model of prayer. And I'll do it very quickly. And you've heard me share this with you before. It's called the ACTS method of prayer. A-C-T-S. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Now, I don't know what your prayer habit is, but I'm going to challenge you to pray every day for five minutes. Every day for five minutes, starting And here are the components. Adoration. That's praise. Spend time praising God. We ought to start praising God, right? We start with prayer. We start with praise. Secondly, we move from praise to confession. God, forgive me. Search my heart, O God. Know my heart and try me. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And and God, do a thorough cleansing. Show me. Show me the areas I need to change and grow and, and, and so that you're confessing your sin. And, and, and by the way, folks, if you stay on top of it, it really helps your spiritual life grow. And then thanksgiving. Do you have anything to be thankful for? I just gave you a bunch of lists out of two verses. And if you need more, I can give you more. You have a lot to be thankful for. And then supplication. Supplication is just a fancy word of praying. Uh, praying first for yourself and then praying for others. Okay? You're, so you're going to intercede for others and you're going to pray for yourself. Okay? And I recommend start with yourself. 
God, help me to be the kind of person that you desire for me to be. Help me not to be obnoxious at work when I'm provoked. God, help me to love my neighbor as much as I love myself. I mean, just pick out the scriptures. Start praying the scriptures, right? Uh, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Help me, Father, not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Uh, Lord, help me to not to walk in the way of sin. God, help me not to walk in the way of sin. Use the script, pray the scripture back to God, all right? And then pray for others. Pray for others, your family, your friends, and so forth. This is a very simple, easy model for you to start praying. And my challenge to you is pray consistently every day this week for five minutes using this method. Is this the only way to pray? Nope. There's other ways to pray. This isn't a magic formula. But if you're not doing anything right now, this is a great place to start. And I bet what you'll find out is five minutes won't be enough. Proper prayer propels the gospel forward. So remember, first, to pray for yourself. We want to pray steadfastly. We want to be uh, alert and watchful. We want to be awake. We want our minds engaged. And we want to be thankful. Remember, it's crucial that we pray for ourselves, but we don't stop there. Look at the second point. Proper prayer expects you to pray for others. Proper prayer expects you to pray for others. Sometimes we can get caught into the trap of self-focus, and we lose the focus of praying for others as well. It becomes, the, it becomes the prayer opera, right? We go to God and we, we pray the prayer opera. You know what the prayer opera is? Me, 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 right? I mean, that's all we do. We just me, 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 you know? We, we don't think about anybody else but ourselves. Well, let's not get caught up in the prayer opera, folks. Uh, we, we need to be praying for other people. And in this passage, Paul wants their prayer specifically for his evangelistic efforts. Look at what he has to say in verses 3 and 4. At the same time, not only praying for yourself, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. So while you are praying for these things that I had mentioned, uh, you, we need to pray, uh, we, need to, we need to be careful that we are uh, praying for others as well. Look at the first one. We pray for other Christians. Verse 3 is very clear. Paul, Timothy, and now Epaphras are imprisoned at Rome, and Paul is asking for prayer on their behalf. Now, folks, very simply, and I'm just going to do this quickly, we ought to be praying for one another because, because all of us are to be serving the Lord. So here, these servants of the Lord are stuck in prison, and Paul is saying, would you pray for us? Would you please pray for us? Right? And we can say, oh, yeah, we should pray for people like Paul because he's, he's way up here, you know, and Peter, and, and, you know, and, oh, yeah, we should pray for, you know, the, the important people, you know, just the important, no, we pray for everyone because we're all servants in the church of Jesus Christ. Every last one of us are servants in the church of Jesus Christ. So we ought to be praying for each other. And that's what Paul is asking for. And when we are serving the Lord, we are carrying a burden we simply cannot bear in our own strength. And so we pray for each other. And Paul needed the prayers of the Colossians. I need your prayers. You need my prayers. And I know there, there are people who love you, that, and, and isn't it good to know that you know there are people that love you and are lifting you up in prayer, that they're lifting you before the throne of grace, that before the God of the universe? It's such an encouragement to know that people are doing that. I know that you are praying for me, and you know that I am praying for you. It's my goal to pray for you daily that I lift you before God's throne of grace. So I ask you, are you praying for other Christians? I hope, I hope you are. Paul gets even more specific. He, sa- he says, Paul, uh, pray that God will open gospel doors. Paul will open gospel doors in verse 3. Now, I want you to notice something about this. I want you to notice what Paul doesn't ask for. He doesn't ask for release, relief. He doesn't ask for release from prison. He doesn't want bail money. Or, he, or for God to get him out of this sticky situation? He doesn't ask for any of those things. What does he ask for? That God would open a door so they might declare the mysterious word of Christ. Isn't that, that's convicting. 
Now, if, if I was to be real honest with you here, folks, I think if I were Paul, I would ask them to pray that I would be set free from jail. I don't deserve to be in here. Would you pray that I could get out of here? He didn't deserve to be there, and he rightfully could ask for that, but he doesn't, he doesn't ask for that. It's convicting to me of what he asks for, is that, that there's more opportunity to share the message of the gospel, which is what got him into prison in the first place. Folks, what about you? What do you ask that people would pray for you? How, what, what do you ask? Do you ask that, that people would pray for you, that God would open a door for the word of God? That, that you would be able to declare the mystery of Christ? I'm afraid, if we're going to be honest, we would be more, more prone to ask God to change our situations rather than to use us to preach the gospel in the situations that we are in. God, change my situation. I don't like this. This is really hard. I don't like this. And he's saying, I put you there because I want you to, to pro- preach the gospel. I want you to share your truth, my truth with those people, whatever the situation might be. Listen, I'm asking that you would pray for me about something. I am very convicted about this. I'm making a personal goal, and I want you to hold me accountable to this. And it's a little bit uh, intimidating to even bring it before you this morning. But I am, a- after studying through this passage and after preparing this sermon, I am making a personal goal to share the mystery of Christ, the Word of God, once a day with someone. I just, that's my goal. In one fashion or another, that I would share the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone. And, and uh, honestly, it's one of those... Uh, those big, hairy, audacious goals, that's what we're supposed to be doing. And so I'm attempting it. So I ask for you to pray for me. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 through 17 says, For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe of of him in whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. 26,000 people live in Allendale, Michigan. Not all of them are Christians. The way they're going to become a Christian is by hearing the word of Christ. It's my job and your job to share that word. So seriously, please pray for me that I will follow through with this goal. And I invite you to join me as well. Look at Paul's next question. Pray for those who suffer for the gospel. Paul and his team were sitting in prison because they dared preach the gospel. This is what will happen when the gospel is preached and taught faithfully. Jesus promised it would be this way in John chapter 15, verses 18 through 23. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they would also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have been guilty of sin. But now now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates the Father also. Listen, every every one of the apostles were martyred, except for John. And John was boiled in oil, which really wasn't all that much better. Every one of them were martyred because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And listen to what Luke says in Luke 6. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and they revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. You see those words? 
We are to rejoice in persecution. We're to rejoice in, in, in being persecuted for the name of Jesus Christ. And church history is replete with examples of people suffering for their faith in Christ. Even today, there's a pastor that's being held behind bars in Turkey. And he's, he was arrested in uh, October of 2016. And he's still there. He's still there. And he was being, he's been accused of being a member uh, of an Islamic movement and, and so forth. And it's all, it's all a bunch of bunk, according to his daughter. In fact, his daughter said, he's not an armed terrorist trying to overthrow any government. My father is a peaceful pastor, she said, noting that she grew up in Turkey. And, and my family loves and respects the Turkish people. And my father has been, a dedi- has been dedicated to serving them for over two decades. Her dad wrote this. He said, let it be clear, I am in prison for not anything I have done wrong, but because of who I am, a Christian pastor. He said, I desperate, he goes on in his note, I desperately miss my wife and children, yet I believe this to be true. It is an honor to suffer for Jesus as many have before me. My deepest thanks for all those around the world who are standing with and praying for me. Those are those are hard words, I'm sure, for him to pen. But he's in jail because he's a follower of Jesus Christ. Are you praying for those who are suffering for the gospel? You know, sometimes we think we suffer for the gospel when we're rebuffed by a comment or whatever. But I don't think any of us have been sitting in jail for three, four years because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Are you praying for those who are suffering for the gospel? Are you aware of how many people are suffering? There are more martyrs today than there have been in all of church history. I'd encourage you to subscribe to the Voice of the Martyrs magazine, and you'll get an idea of just how bad it is out there. And then look at Paul's last prayer. Pray for Christians to make the message clear. This is verse 4. So here it is, Paul's main concern. It's not for his suffering in prison. It's for the sake of the gospel. It's not for his comfort or for his peace. It's not for anything but this, that I may make it, the gospel, clear, which is how I ought to speak. You see this? Paul is sitting in prison, and he's saying, here is what I want you to pray for me about, that I would be able to speak clearly so that the gospel would go forth from my mouth, that people would understand it, and the implication is that they would repent and become followers of Jesus Christ. That's what's on Paul's heart, and I have to pray that God changes my heart. Do do I care that much about people's souls? Do you care that much about people's souls that, that, that you would ask God to change your heart to be like the Apostle Paul? He's not worried about his comfort. He's not worried about his, the accoutrements or, the, or, or whatever it is that he, he wants in prison. What he wants is to be able to speak clearly the message of the gospel. Goals are important in life. Stephen Covey said this, begin with the end in mind. That's a great goal. Uh, Joe Vitale said this, a goal should scare you a little and excite you a lot. Goals keep you on track and they lead you to a certain destination. It's good for us to have goals. Paul had a God-sized goal that no matter to whom he spoke, he could and would be able to clearly articulate the gospel of Jesus Christ. And honestly, from Paul's perspective, This was nothing special. It was something that, as he says in his own words, that he ought to do. It was how he ought to speak. It was his Christian responsibility and privilege. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says this, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Can I ask you another question? Can you clearly articulate the gospel to someone? Can you clearly sit down with someone and explain the entirety of the gospel to them? 
And I will be honest with you about something. I was a pastor, and I, was, I wasn't the senior pastor. I was a youth pastor. And my job was to stand on the side. The senior pastor was there, and then we had the other pastor over there. And my job was to help anyone that would, might come forward after a service, after a sermon, and help them to understand the gospel, to share the gospel with them. So we would sing a hymn or whatever, and we'd invite people to come forward and so forth. And so all the while, and this is, I'm being straight up honest with you, all the while, I was a new pastor, my prayer was a very holy prayer. It was, dear Lord, do not send them to me. Dear Lord, do not send them to me. Dear Lord, do not send them to me. Send them to Mike, not to me. Send them to Wayne, not to me. That was my prayer. And you know what? God convicted me about that. That I better learn how to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not just because I'm a pastor, but because I'm a believer. That I might clearly articulate the gospel as I ought. So can you? Can you do that? I hope you can. So I, I encourage you, if you do not know how to share the gospel, come and talk to me. I have more tools in my toolbox than I know what to do with. I'd be happy to share them with you. So Paul wants, Paul wants the Colossians to pray for him and to specifically pray for him that God would open the doors for the, uh, for the gospel, that, that, that he would be okay with the suffering that he's enduring and that, that they would be able to preach Jesus and, and, and share the, the, the glorious mystery of Jesus Christ as clearly as possible. This is what he's asking. So let me give you some, let me give you some ideas on how to get started praying for others. You ready? It's going to be fast and furious. Make a list. Make a list. Pray for your family. Pray for your church family. You mean the whole church family? Yep, the whole church family. It's right online. You, don't, you, don't have, you can just pull your computer up and pull up the directory. It's right there. Pray for your friends. Pray for your missionaries. Pray for people who need Christ. I, I, I've been pray, these, are, these are who I, this is what I pray for on a daily basis. Pray for those in authority. Pray for those you are discipling. Pray for churches and area pastors that they would preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pray for those who are suffering around the world. Pray. This is what God wants us to do. Will this take time? Yes. Can you do it? Yes. Is it worth it? Yes. It does take time. It takes me... To go through my prayer time, it takes me uh, 30 to 45 minutes a day. It takes time. But are you willing to give 30 to 45 minutes, an hour to the Lord on a daily basis for something so important? It will take time. According to this passage, is prayer an option? No, it's not. And I will tell you, if every every believer in this room decides to obey God and to start to really pray for others, we will put a serious dent in reaching the 26,000 people in Allendale, Michigan, as well as the students at GVSU. It's not a strategic plan. That's not what's going to do it. It's us getting on our knees praying. Proper prayer propels the gospel forward. So remember two things. Pray for yourself and pray for others. And let me remind you as we close what Max Lucado said. Our prayers may be awkward. Our attempts may be feeble. But since the power of prayer is in the one who hears and not in the one who says it, our prayers do make a difference. Father, thank you that you hear us. Thank you that you want to hear us. Thank you that you have torn open the veil so that we can boldly approach the throne of grace. God, we need to be a people of prayer. We need to be a people who love to talk to you. And forgive us, Lord, that we are so easily distracted with vain things like Facebook and Instagram and, and our cell phones and all those things. Not inherently evil, but if they keep us from you, Father, help us to get rid of them so that our main focus can be to propel the gospel forward in prayer. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.